even in the middle of the hot summer, when many people are gone on vacation, when we're tempted to just sit under a shade tree, we can come together and still worship, glorify, honor, and praise you. And so, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be here today, that your Holy Spirit would be in full control, and that ultimately we would lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. May he be glorified and praised in everything we say and do. So, Father, refresh us, encourage us, but help us most of all to worship you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.
Gonzalez and Nate Ewer all have birthdays in the month of August. And then anniversaries. Jessica and Sean Long have an anniversary on Sean's birthday. Mark and Debbie Sutherland also have an anniversary. I can't remember who they are. And Claude and Kathy Trout have an anniversary coming up as well. So, uh, gentlemen, be forewarned. <laughs> okay, you've been reminded that your anniversary is occurring. All right, moving we'll right along. Tonight, in our evening fellowship hour, we're going to do something different. Now, we are going to meet together and have our little potluck time, you might say, food and fellowship at 5.30. But at 6 o'clock tonight, we're just going to do a sing along. So, if you have songs that you want us to consider, you might just uh, take your bulletin and write down some numbers and hand them to Patty Morehouse. And again, we're going to try to work out some of these. But the idea is we're just going to get together for fellowship tonight and sing. So that is at 6 o'clock tonight. Moving right along, we want to remind you about the church library. And it is open. And we have uh, new books that are being donated. And there's other things. And so be sure and check it out. Remember, you can always go out this exit uh, if you go to the library first, and it's always uh, open. Operation Christmas Child. That is what our coin jar is all about. In just a few minutes, we're going to be showing you a video to remind you of the significance of Operation Christmas Child. But uh, anyway, remember that is for shipping costs for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, on Thursday mornings, the ladies are getting together, and they are now starting to assemble. Okay, they have an assembly line. However, they still could use some more items. And on the back table, there's a list of items, and I believe there's even some little uh, stickies where you can take a, uh, uh, a suggestion home with you and uh, like get some crayons or something like that. So they still need supplies. They still need workers to put these all together. All right, what we're going to do now is remind you about what Operation Christmas Child is all about. Why do we do the things we are doing? My name is Kim. I am originally from Cambodia. Cambodia is one of the very, very poor countries. People living less than a dollar per day. My family live in the small village in Badawal province and we don't have enough food to eat. So, so I had to go to the farm to have my parents dig in the ground. So it's very, very difficult. One day I just walked past by the, by the pastor house back from school. So um, the pastor just gave me the invitation to join the Christmas program and they tell me they have something for us. And then they say, also they have food. So I would love to come because of food. So when I came to this month's celebration, they were singing, they were worshiping, they were praying, they were talking about God and Jesus. On the end of the service, they hand us a box and we open it. They have a jump rope. I also receive a book and also some color pen. called the David gift. So I saw that was so interesting because they had a story in there and they had the color, they had a picture and I read it over and over and in that booklet will tell about God, Jesus Christ and God will be die on the cross for us and I not just read it to myself, I also read it to my brother. He wanted me to read to him every evening. After I said show book, I keep asking myself, where the box come from? Who had the shoe box? Why you give it to me? And I'm just a poor kid. So I went back to church. I asked the pastor where the shoe box come from and what is about Jesus Christ? What is God? And he said, if you want to know more, you can read the Bible. So he gave me the Bible to read. So I came to church about 
two or three months, come to a bachelor. I receive a good data that help me to go to use camp. So when I use camp, I will just have so amazed on the worship bank, they pray in the early morning, and I will like get a good song all the time when I will go to the big uh, worship. So I was like crying. So then at the end of the service, Pastor was preaching about God and he asked him who want to give their life to God. I just go in from there and give my lead. And I say, God, I give my life to you. I give my life to you. Sometimes when I at home, sitting there with my kids, with my husband, I was asking myself, if we know that I should work, I will not be here. Just every single day, thank God for all His blessings.
Father, I guess we shouldn't be surprised because we've read the book and we know what's going to happen in the future. So, Father, again, please be with Israel during this time, and especially those that you are bringing back to that land. And then, Father, we want to pray for our international workers around the world, especially the Griffins at Uruguay. Father, we thank you for your protection over them. But, Father, again, for all of our workers, we realize there's multiple dangers that exist. Be with them and use them today, wherever they're at, that the gospel of Jesus Christ may go forward. For it's in his name we ask it. If you have your uh, bulletins, we do have uh, in there a list of prayer requests. And so if you would turn to that, we would love to go over some of these uh, prayer needs together and be uh, praying for one another. Just a few updates. First of all, a very sad update. Patty Smith, who's on the list, and that is uh, Karen's uh, mother. She did pass away. Many of you have heard she had been sent to um, Seattle for emergency.
emergency kidney surgery to her cancer. She did not survive. Karen <coughs> was able to go and be with her. But now pray for Karen, uh, not only for uh, this time of grief, but also um, most of you know that uh, the house that Annie was living in was hers, and Karen had been staying with her to take care of her. So the question is whether or not she'll be able to stay in that house. So please be praying about that situation. Then uh, Virginia Gatfield got a hold of us this week and asked us to pray for two of her friends. She did not give us last names. The ladies' names are Elaine and Terry, and both of them either have COVID or have COVID-like symptoms and have been very ill, so she asked for prayer. <clears throat> then if you are on our text-based uh, prayer chain, you got an update that we shared from uh, Phil Smith regarding Jolene. Uh, of course, they live in Texas. Uh, they used to be a part of this church. Fine Christian couple. Jolene is not doing well at all. And even though know, she had a stroke, was recovering from that, she got a double infection, ended up in the hospital. While in the hospital, she and Phil apparently both contracted COVID. Hers went into pneumonia. Phil has had to stay at home, but finally now he's over his so he can now visit her. They are thinking about moving to her to a rehab facility, but at this point, she's not able to talk not able to eat. So it does not look good at all. <clears throat> Many of you know that uh, Jolene has been ill for most of her life. And so anyway, please be praying for them. This is a very difficult time. Uh, Alice, Paula, and Tex. <clears throat> uh, Alice was not with us this morning. Uh, she had a root canal last week. And now she's just as much pain as she was before she had the root canal. So something is not right. She's going to have to go back in. The dentist, but she's in a lot of discomfort. And then she has to prepare for her Tex uh, because Tex uh, is simply deteriorating as far as his, his mental faculties are concerned. So it really needs our prayers. Um, that is the main updates that I have. Uh, are there any other updates or any other prayer requests we need to know? basically the 
the vice president of all of Egypt. And his own family had to come during this great time of famine and bend food out of it. They stayed. They stayed for 400 years. They went from being a family to a nation. And Pharaoh was very, very jealous of them. And so he made them all slaves. He started to try to kill the firstborn males of the families. Well, God had a plan. Remember Moses? Moses uh, was saved, uh, and uh, his mother put him in a reed basket. Pharaoh's daughter found the basket, raised him as the prince of Egypt. And at age 40, he tried to deliver his own people. <clears throat> it didn't go very well. So he ran for his life. In the next 40 years, he's a shepherd on the backside of the wilderness. Age 80, God comes along through a burning bush and says, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt to deliver my people. He says, you found the wrong guy. But remember, God got a hold of him, sent his brother Aaron. They go back to Egypt. Remember the ten plagues? Eventually, Pharaoh lets the people go. Changes his mind when they get to the Red Sea. The Red Sea splits. And after it splits, well, they cross on dry land. But when Pharaoh's army tries to do the same thing, they get inundated. Uh, anyway, as a result, now they're in the wilderness. They're headed to the promised land. God wants to prepare them as a nation. And so he provides food for them. He provides water for them. He provides commandments for them. We've taken a look at the Ten Commandments. But now he's giving them instructions regarding the tabernacle. Remember, God had a plan. He wanted to dwell among his people. He wanted to live amongst them. And so as they were sojourning for the wilderness, he gave them a temporary structure. It was like a tent. Remember, we've taken a look at the tent. In the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, which represents Jesus. Jesus is our Mercy Seat. Outside of that curtain, in the Holy Place, there was, first of all, the table of showbread. Jesus is the bread of life. There's the candelabra. Jesus is the light of the world. Just recently, we added a third piece of furniture. Remember what that was? The altar of incense. And we said that you and I today are a sweet fragrance in God's sight. And our prayers are like incense going up into heaven. Outside of the actual tent in the courtyard was this altar where they could burn the sacrifices. We talked about the courtyard itself. Now there was only one way in and one way out. And of course, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So now as we're progressing, we've talked about the anointing oil. We've talked about the priestly garments. Now we're going to talk about another item that doesn't go inside the holy place or most holy place. It's in the courtyard. But it is going to go between the brazen altar where they sacrifice these animals day after day after day. Thankfully, we don't have to do that. Why? Because Jesus sacrificed himself how many times? Once, Once for all. But between now the brazen altar and the entrance to the holy place, another very important piece of furniture is going to go. Our key verse this morning is not going to be in Exodus 30. It is going to be in the New Testament again. Because, again, we are contrasting what things are like under the Old Covenant and what things are like under the New Covenant. In 1 John 1.9, a verse that many of you know, but you may have never related to the tabernacle before, is this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You might say, what in the world does that have to do with the tabernacle? Well, you have to stay awake and find out. The point that we want to make this morning is this. Cleansing in the old covenant came by water. In the new covenant, it comes by the Spirit. Cleansing. Cleansing. So the question that I need to ask myself is, have I been cleansed spiritually? So let's talk about cleansing. Cleansing in the old covenant, Cleansing in the New Covenant. First of all, cleansing in the Old Covenant. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 17, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, You must also make a basin of bronze with 
its base, also of bronze, for washing. And you must put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. And you must put water in it. So the bronze labor had no specific dimensions. It was essentially a pool for ceremonial washings set between the brazen altar and the tent of meeting. So again, in your mind, construct this picture. You've got this curtain all the way around the courtyard. When you go through the one entrance, right in front of you is this brazen altar, this huge altar. And from it will be flame and smoke as they're sacrificing animals. There's blood everywhere. These animals are being thrown on the fire. They're burning. But now between that altar and the tent, the meeting, and the one doorway that goes into the holy place, now is this big bronze basin. And the pictures that I've seen of it show something on top for your hands and something below for your feet. Why? Because in verse 19 it says this, For Aaron and his sons must wash their hands and their feet from it. So the labor then was to stand in the great courtyard before men entered the tent itself. Priests must certainly have needed to wash after sacrifice and blood ritual. So it had practical value as well. Can, can you imagine? They're out in the desert to begin with. And just walking to the tabernacle, what's going to have to happen to your feet when you're wearing sandals? Yeah. They're going to get dusty and dirty. You know, I do a number of graveside services, and I will dress up in a nice suit, I put on my nice, clean, black leather shoes, and I go out to the cemetery, and I'm standing at the graveside, and I look down at my shoes, and what color are they? Brown. Yeah, gray, dusty brown. They were clean when I left the office, but just walking through the cemetery, my feet get dirty. So can you imagine these people out in the desert? And, of course, there's animals everywhere. And these animals that are being brought to the tabernacle, some of them might leave something behind. And then they're taking knives, and they're slaughtering these animals. They're shedding their blood. And so they were getting dirty. They had blood. They had dirt upon them. But now they were supposed to go from there into the holy place. Before God, dirty as they were, they needed to be cleaned up. You know, in Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 through 4, it says this, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So there was this need for a physical, but also a ceremonial cleansing before they went in to do their duties. Verse 20. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister by burning incense as an offering made by fire to the Lord, they must wash with the water so that they will not die. So if somebody came before the Lord dirty and filthy, this would be totally disrespecting God and His holiness. And so they could be struck dead if that were to happen. Verse 21. So they must wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. And it will be a perpetual statute for them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So that's cleansing in the Old Covenant. Okay? These priests had a need. They needed to get clean. They needed to wash up before they went in to do their inside duty. Well, what about cleansing in the New Covenant? Now, we've said everything so far in the tabernacle somehow points forward to what the Lord wants to do in our lives today. And I believe that cleansing is part of it. So first of all, let's go to the book of Matthew in the New Testament. Jesus is talking to a bunch of Pharisees. These Pharisees were religious Jewish men. And they thought that they were doing all the outside rituals that they needed to do. So what does Jesus say to them? Chapter 23, verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You 
cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and greed. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may also be clean. So let's say uh, you're having people over for dinner, and, and you feed them some sort of soup, a very thick soup. And after dinner, you, you take the bowls into the kitchen, and you very carefully wipe the outside. But you don't touch the inside at all. You just set it to the counter and let it dry. Oh. Yeah. That makes no sense at all. If you're going to clean something, it's not just the outside that needs to be cleaned, but the inside that needs to be cleaned. So the Pharisees that were following all the rituals of the law, well, the outside was clean, but on the inside they were filthy. How do we know? Well, he goes on. Verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So if you wanted to be clean as a Jew, you couldn't have contact with a dead body. And so when people died, they immediately buried them, but their bodies hadn't decayed yet. They are put in a tomb. So the thought was that if a Jew touched a tomb with a dead person, that would make them unclean. So they took a whitewash, and they painted them. So you're going along this valley, and you see these whitewashed areas, you know, don't touch that. By the way, remember the story of the Good Samaritan? you got a priest and a Levite, and they're headed to Jerusalem to do their thing in the temple, and there's this guy laying by the side of the road, all bruised and bloody. You don't know if he's dead or alive. What do they do? They go to the other side of the road. They don't touch him. Because if they touch him and he's dead, they can't do their job in Jerusalem. Well, this hated Samaritan comes along and he picks up this bloody, bruised, dying man, takes him back to the inn, cleans up his wounds, pays for his lodging, takes care of him, and goes on his way. Jesus said, who's the true friend? But that's why the priest and the Levite didn't touch him. He said, I could have been dead. So Jesus is saying, you hypocrites. You Pharisees, you follow all these outside rituals. You'll go to the mikvah, you'll go ahead and dunk in the water, you come out, you put on clean clothes, you go to the temple. Outwardly, you're fine. But on the inside, you are full of dead men and bones, just like these graves. You're filthy, you're sinful. Now, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it remains in the vine, neither can you, unless you remain in me. Amen. Jesus is talking about spirituality here. <laughs> He's not just giving them a lesson on viticulture, okay? Yes, if vines don't produce fruit, you lop them off. Okay? Jesus said you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. So you see what's going on here? Jesus' concern is not just on the outward appearance, but what's going on on the inside. Aaron and his sons could go from the brazen altar, go over to the bronze labor, they could even have bars of ivory soap. I don't think they had them yet. Maybe they had died. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. And they just would go to work and clean themselves up. They'd wash their feet. And they would go into the holy place filthy on the inside. In Acts chapter 15, we have this great Jerusalem conference. And remember, the early church was predominantly Jewish. So when Gentiles became believers, the question was, Boy, hey, what do we do with these Gentiles? Can the Gentile be saved? So who does this work of cleaning?
cleansing that makes it different for us on the inside. Well, in Acts chapter 15, verse 6, it says, The apostles and elders assembled to consider this matter. After much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God decided among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, approved of them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between them and us, and purified their hearts by faith. Can you believe this? A Gentile who's unclean on the outside, because they eat the wrong food, they associate with the wrong type of people. You know, a good Jew would even go into the house of a Gentile, because they make them unclean. But now these unclean Gentiles are clean on the inside. They've been purified. How? By the Holy Spirit of God. God has been at work on the inside. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said this. Such were some of you. He has a whole list of bad traits, bad things. Okay? But you were washed. You were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Corinth was a horrible place. It was a filthy place, morally. And yet these Christians were made whole. They were sanctified, they were washed, they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Spirit's cleansing on the inside of them. 2 Corinthians 7 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There's a lot of dirt out there in the world, and it's not just the dirt I get on me when I'm using our media, it's moral. And we live in a society that is becoming more filthy every day. But we can be cleansed by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about the work of Jesus Christ. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And that he might present to himself a glorious church, having not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So we're cleansed not by a bronze labor where we wash our hands and feet and arms and everything else, but by the word of God, it is a washing in our lives through the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says this. In a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also those of wood and clay. Some are for honor, some are for dishonor. One who cleanses himself from these things will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, fit for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. So in Jerusalem, they had stone or wooden vessels that they ate of all the time. In fact, when they do archaeology around the Jerusalem area, they find these, these stone vessels that are broken, pottery, all the time. But the truly important ones were the silver ones that were set apart, were sanctified, they were clean, were used in the temple only for worship of the Lord. And so God wants to cleanse our lives and make us prepared for his work. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the replicas of heavenly things be cleansed with these sacrifices, and that the heavenly things themselves be cleansed with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter holy places made with hands, which are patterned after the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So God has already prepared our cleansing. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, not only arranged our forgiveness of sins, if I can be so crass, 
It's not just that we have internal fire insurance, okay? We're not going to burn. But the idea is that he wants to cleanse our lives and purify our lives for his service as well. In Hebrews chapter 10, Therefore, brothers, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to what? Cleanse them from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So God is not concerned only with the outside, but with the inside, with our hearts as well. We have been cleansed, we have been purified for his service. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit therefore yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, not just the outside, the inside. First John, chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what? Cleanses us from all sin. And then our key verse. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, there's cleansing in the Old Covenant and cleansing in the New Covenant. Now, I want to point out something. 1 John 1 9. It says this if we confess our sins. Now, I am not a Greek expert. Don't pretend to be a Greek expert. I took two years of Greek in college. I took a semester of New Testament exegesis in seminary, and I know just enough to be dangerous. Okay? But the experts tell me that the word confess there is in the present continuous tense. What does that mean? It means that it could be translated if we keep on confessing our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that we have to come to the altar every Sunday to be saved? Does that mean that every time we, we have a bad thought or sin, we're in danger of losing our salvation? No, 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 no. That's not what it means at all. The atonement has been made. The price has been paid once and for all. So if you know Jesus and you've been born again, you're going to be with him. But what about our relationship with him? What about our fellowship with him? Now, I'm a nice guy. I'm a really nice guy. I'm a really, really nice guy. But if you hurt my feelings, I, I'm liable to feel bad. And maybe I'm not going to want to be around you. Our, our relationship, our fellowship has been kind of damaged. But if you come to me and say, Steve, I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to do that. Will you forgive me? I will say, no, I'm never going to speak to you again. Right? No. I'm going to say, yes, sure, I'll forgive you. Our relationship's repaired. And we go on and we have good fellowship with one another. So when we commit acts of sin, it doesn't affect our eternal salvation, but it does affect our relationship with God. Now, what was the tabernacle all about? A place that God could dwell with his people. God wanted the priests to come in. But before they came in, they needed to wash. They needed to be cleansed. But it's obvious that Jesus is concerned more about what's going on on the inside than what's 
what's going on on the outside. So as we go through lives as believers, even though our sins are forgiven as far as heaven's concerned, still our relationship with God needs to be cleaned up. So if we keep on confessing our sins, we keep our relationship current. We keep our fellowship current. Now, I don't know about you, but I need to do a lot of confessing. I'm not perfect. I'm still a sinner. I'm saved by grace. Praise God. But I still need to confess. Now, I told you earlier in Sunday school that Don spoiled my whole message. <laughs> you see, Dan's son was going to sit next to him. And he said, well, you know, I, 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 I took a shower or a bath on New Year's Day. <laughs> Can you imagine what all of us would be like in this 100 degree plus weather? <laughs> if you haven't had a bath since January 1st, <laughs> hmm, I'm not so sure I would want to be around some of you. Even when you take a shower like you do every morning and use my deodorant every morning, sometimes by the end of the day I'm not so sure I want to be around myself. <laughs> in the same way, we need to be clean, not just physically, but spiritually. And so remember what our key verse is this morning? If we keep on confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleansing in the old covenant came by water. In the new covenant, it comes by the Spirit. And the Spirit of God lives in our life and wants to work in our life and cleanse our life. So the question is, have I been cleansed spiritually? You know, you can take a shower every hour on the hour. You can use deodorant. You can use foo-foo water. You... <laughs> I had a family come in the other day to meet me about a funeral. Oh, my goodness. I, I had to open the door afterwards. I thought I was going to pass out. Why did I think they took a bath in foo-foo water? Woo! Smell really good. But you can do everything to keep yourself clean on the outside. But the Lord wants us to be clean on the inside. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for these stories out of Scripture. And Father, just as you gave the nation of Israel and the priests the bronze labor so they could clean up before going to meet with you, Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. He wants us to be forgiven. Father, he also wants us to be clean on the inside. Help us to look to you. Help us to worship you. Help us to serve you. Help us to confess when we need to confess. Of course, in Jesus' name, yes. Amen. Amen.
Dan, if you could pronounce the benediction. Oh, Father, it's been so good for us to sit in this place and to hear of your word again and to sing your praises. Father, the message is so true for us. And we do get dirty on the inside. Help us to apply that verse to our lives moment by moment that we do and we continually ask you to forgive us of not just of the obvious things, but those subtle little attitudes that sneak in upon us and we like to harbor those. But bring those to our mind and we bring them to you and help us to long to ever be in greater fellowship with you. Thank you again for our time here. Bless us as we go our way. Pray these things now in Jesus' name. All God's Amen. people said? Amen. Amen.